So um, our keynote today is Jennifer Valk from Karolinska Institute, and we are very happy to have her here. She's an educational developer and a senior lecturer for the very um, newly named unit, Unit for Teaching and Learning. And we are excited to have her here um, and um, share with us a little bit from her daily work and her um, experience at Karolinska. So welcome, Jenny. Thank you, Natalie. Um, thank you very much. So um, I'm going to introduce a little bit more myself a little bit more in depth. Um, so uh, my name is Jenny. I'm an education developer and my areas of expertise lie in international education, intercultural education and English medium instruction. So teaching and learning through English or actually through any foreign language. And so I've been working at Karolinska for now four years, and I was recruited to help them implement their internationalization action plan, so internationalization of education. And for the past uh, year and a half, my team and I have secured a um, research grant to internationalize the curriculum of five of our study programs. And actually, that's what I'm going to share with you a little bit today. Um, we're supposed to come up with uh, guidelines and recommendations for all Swedish higher education institutions on how to internationalize the curriculum. And we're going to actually be presenting that in November at the UHOER Internationalization Days. So I don't know if um, uh, you may want to attend, but we'll be sharing our tools and recommendations. But I'm going to give you a little taster uh, today. So... Um, you have my information here, um, and you, will, you have all the stuff I'm taking you through today is available on our website. So if you just go to the Karolinska website and you type internationalization, you get into our, our web page. And there's a section there on internationalization of the curriculum. So, um, but today, I wanted to focus more specifically on intercultural perspectives and developing our students' intercultural competences. But in order for us to do that, we need to develop our own as teachers. Uh, and so I wanted to go a little bit more into detail uh, about that because it's in our, on the horizon for us. Um, following Agneta Blood's uh, inquiry for the internationalization of education and research, um, there's a very strong focus on developing intercultural competences. But of course, I'm placing that in the wider context of internationalizing education. Uh, and so I want to, uh, first of all, find out a little bit more about you. I'm going to get you to do a little polling online. So um, you can do that via a phone or your laptop. So if you could, as I'm speaking, connect to the internet, that would be great. Um, I, I want us to have a bit of a conversation about what is culture. Well, what is culture within academia? What are academic cultures? What are... Uh, you know, we always think about cultures in terms of, you know, food and architecture and art. And well, what does it mean, actually, for, for universities uh, to develop intercultural competences for their staff and their students? Um, and then I, I'm going to share with you a model of internationalized intended learning outcomes. We use constructive alignment at Karolinska to internationalize the curriculum of our programs. So that means that we align program intended learning outcomes uh, uh, or national ones and the program level are also aligned at the course level. So meaning that your intended learning uh, outcomes are aligned with your teaching and learning arrangements, what's happening in the classroom and also assessment. So I'll, I'll kind of share with you uh, uh, some of our, our thoughts and a bit of, about our journey, actually, because um, we've been inspired very much by Professor Betty Lesk. She published a book, uh, Internationalizing the Curriculum. And um, based on her work uh, in La Trobe University in Australia. And um, we've used and based our, let's say, our work on hers. But of course, it's all about really adapting it to your own context. And what works at Karolinska you know, might not work at another university, although we're all addressing the same kind of issues. Um, so uh, we have used Betty Lesk's uh, model because it's 
you know, proven, it's tested, it's researched, there's a lot of evidence of what not to do, and I think that's very useful. But I can't really give you like a ready-made recipe, this is what you should do in your class, this is what you should do at SLU, because the whole point is for you to really consider, well, what does internationalization mean for my discipline? What does it mean within my institution for in my program? Uh, and, you know, obviously at which level of, of the curriculum are you, are you teaching at? So it really is something that um, teams of teach teachers should be discussing and working at. It's a great opportunity to rethink uh, and, and integrate perspectives that are, are maybe not so visible. I, I don't want to say that these perspectives are missing, because in our experience, the first thing we found out is when we went to talk to all the study programs, uh, we found that there's a huge amount of activities to do with internationalizing education, but nothing is named as such. So you don't have ILOs that have developed international perspectives or intercultural competence or something more specific than that. Or, you know, we want our students to be globally engaged. These words are not there, but they, these things are happening in the classroom. So the very first thing, the first bit of advice or recommendation I can give to you is look at what you're doing with glasses of internationalization on. And, you know, and if you're already doing some things, this should be made visible. And the, a great way to make things visible to our students and to, to everyone else is through using constructive alignment and having you know, these key terms and ideas in your uh, ILOs at the course and the program level. And, and then I'll give you some examples of some of the stuff we've, we've been doing. And at the end of the presentation, which I'll, I'll make available uh, to, to you uh, after today, uh, there's a whole list of references where you, not just those that I, I've put in the, pre, uh, the PowerPoint, but some other references, and I've made a list of very useful websites that you may want to consult. Okay, but I, I don't pay any attention to this information. I want you to connect to, I'm going to put it here, whoops, to the website menti.com, and this is the correct code, 541515. Before... I'm just going to let you connect, but don't even start anything. I just wanted to actually get to know you as a group, you know. I mean, we're all, you know, you're all working here at this university in Uppsala, but are you all the same? Are we all the same? Do we all have the same backgrounds? Where do we come from? What languages do we speak? You know, that has a huge influence on, on you know, how we think about internationalization. Um, you know, if I, if I kind of bring it back to my own story and my own journey, um, I was born in Brussels. My mother is French-speaking Belgian, so French is m one of my first languages. I don't really like to use the term mother tongue because I think you also learn languages from your fathers. Um, so my father's British, uh, and so English is also my second first language. Um, but, you know, um, that doesn't really give very much information about me. You know, you're thinking... Mm, do you know anything about Belgium? Do you know, you know, I'm thinking, you were all thinking, mm, Brexit, probably, you know, every time you meet a British person. So I'm um, part Scottish, part Northern Irish, so we voted to remain, right? Uh, and so I'm very happy that I have double nationality because that makes me quite a lucky person. Um, I've, I was raised in Nigeria uh, uh, from the age of six to 13, but then I return there every holiday. I've lived in the UK, I've lived in Italy, I've lived in Belgium most of my life, and I moved to Sweden four years ago. So there are certain parts of me, or cities, that I feel a local from that give you a better, more complex picture of the type of person I am. Because I think that if we just look at nationality, it doesn't really give a very very much information. Really, nationality is just a piece of paper, really. Also, nationality is very political. And we know from the changing demographics of our classrooms that actually, you know, there's the question, where are you from? Sweden, yeah, but where are you really from? This kind of, because you don't correspond to the Swedish stereotype, let's say. These are very touchy questions. Um, and so it's much easier, let's say, when, when I, I talk to my students, uh, who are not just diverse, they are super diverse. 
I mean, think a little bit what your classrooms were like when you were a student and what they're like today, right? Um, I was very cheeky because I've been kind of talking about this at Karolinska and a lot of, a bit of the, the let's say, the, the obstacles to embracing intercultural education is the fact that a lot of teachers are like, oh yeah, but our, our programs are Swedish, our students are Swedes. But what does that mean? Um, so I got a Swedish student who really does not look like a Swede. First of all, he has brown skin. And I got him to present himself, so he's studying in the medical program, third, third year student. And I got him to present himself because um, he was born in Finland. Uh, his father is Finnish, his mother is Swedish. But as I said, he's got brown skin. And you know, he presents himself, yes, well, so I, I, I speak Swedish, I speak Finnish. I learned English at school. It was logical for me to come from Finland to Stockholm to study uh, medicine because I wanted to improve my Swedish, blah, blah, blah. And then, I, you know, I, we kind of opened up the conversation to the teachers. And the first question one of the teachers was asked was, well, yeah, but wh where, where are you really from? And he's like, Finland. And he's like, the teachers went, well, what's your first language? And the student went, German. <laughs> and I, I was thinking, okay, that's what super diversity is, is we ha now have generations of students whose parents probably migrated or were refugees or came from another country, settled in another European country, were, um, or were born there, were raised there, went to school there, probably traveled to another country to study. Thank you, Erasmus. Um, maybe fell in love, stayed there, um, you know, learned the language there, maybe got their first job, and then maybe later on even moved to a third European country to, for work. And this is, you know, this is more and more common. And the University of Birmingham has theorized a lot about this idea of super diversity. And I invite you to go and have a look. I've put some references. It's, it's very interesting because it kind of flips our understanding of identity compared to maybe, if I can generalize, our generation and older, let's say, it helps us to understand who these younger people are in our classrooms. So, I've told you about me, and I want to find out about you. So I've, I'm going to ask you two questions. The first one is, what languages are you fluent in? So, you know, this includes your first languages and any other language. I'm, I'm not going to test you, so you can just, you know. You decide what you think fluent means. And then uh, I'm going to ask you, where are you a local from? So which cities do you feel that you belong to? A city where you've lived and you think you can you know, f find your way around easily, maybe know a few places to go eat, a few, place, a few bars or, you know, I don't know, any, uh, anything you could... A city where you, you would, could recommend people visiting it where to go and what to do. Okay, so I'm going to... Um, okay, so you've already answered some of this. O obviously, I was expecting Swedish and English to be the largest... Oh, sorry, I'm going to put this down. There we go. So this is nice. You know this word cloud? The more people put, enter the same word, the bigger it becomes on the screen, and then it keeps switching around. I forgot to say, we should all write in English <laughs> as a lingua franca, right, as the, as the shared language, because I can see Engelska there somewhere, flying around. It's always nice to see what people define as language. You know, I did this with a, a whole bunch of engineers a few months ago, and they all put, like, you know, C++ and... All the, and Pascal and all these other languages. <laughs> right. So I'm just I'm going to attempt to count them. I think we have 24, 23, 24 different languages. 23 because we have Angelska and uh, English there, but. I mean, of course we're expecting lots of languages, European languages, right? Because we're European and of course, you know, we're in Sweden, we're expecting this. But look, as many, as many people speak German as speak English in the room. So of course, you know, we've got 
French, um, Spanish, Finnish, Danish, Italian, Portuguese, Lithuanian. Uh, what else have we got? Various spellings of the word English. Uh, Russian, Italian. So, and then I, I was going to look. Do we have anything outside of Europe? Korean? Arabic? Or, although so many people speak Arabic in Europe now. Okay. And then you've got illustration language. I'm guessing some, one of you is an illustrator, right? And then someone put empathy. Empathy. And that's quite interesting that someone put that. The empathy is, you know, is one of the core dimensions of being interculturally competent. And the good thing is empathy can be learned. Uh, and so just, you know, a thought out there. Is this what we should be including in our curricula at university? Because we're very much focused on content. Um, content, actually. Only content, right? I need to teach this. I need to stick to my content. No, I can't. We can't move the, change the curriculum because then we're going to take things out. As if knowledge is fixed and we can't touch it. Although we, sh we all know, being researchers, that knowledge is an evolving organic concept. So knowledge, content, which we're very focused on, competences, but then what about values, attitudes, and behaviors? And if you look at the Sustainable Development Goals uh, and agenda, agenda 2030, and you look at what they define as quality education, these aspects are in there, the values, the attitudes, the behaviors. So is this an opportunity for us to finally rethink a little bit how we are teaching and what we are teaching and why? Okay. So I am going to ask you now, now we've seen that we're a very multilingual group. Now I want you to do the same with where are you a local from? So any cities? that you feel local. Sorry? Well, yes, it's a complicated one because sometimes you don't go back to the city where you were raised. But if you feel you could still get around that city, put it put it down. No one's going to check. <laughs> yes. City, town, any, yes, obviously. City, town, village, area, region, whatever you want to put there. If, if you think you know a whole country, put the whole country. Yes, there's a lot more usually in this one. Um, if I had asked, if I asked the same questions to our students, like how many languages are you fluent in, and where are you a local from, how do you think their responses differ from ours, from something like this? Do you think it's the same? Do you think it's less? Do you think it's small? More. more? So um, next week I'm doing this again, but. Last year, you know, we do this, like all universities, these welcome weeks for our first year master's students. So we get them all in a room. Usually we get about 350. We should have more, but we usually get about 350 students in the room. And I asked them, where are you local from? And last time we had 670 odd different destinations from the whole world. I mean, usually Antarctica is missing, but that's about it, right? 
Uh, and so here, of course, you know, we've got a lot of cities in, um, in, uh, in Sweden. Obviously, uh, Uppsala and Stockholm, Malmö, Göteborg, Lund, the big city, Umeå, the largest cities. But there's also all sorts, and this is where you see <coughs> my geography is really bad. So lots of cities I've, or places I've never heard about. Um, but then we've also got, you know, different, different places uh, in Europe. I'm trying to focus on some. Dundee, uh, what have we got there? Yes, you know, um, Camarillo, what else have we got? Places I have no idea, but I can see some Harare, Africa, I can see New York, I can see, I can't, I can't see them all, obviously, but I'm, I'm just trying, Dubai, I can see, so we've got Asia, Middle East represented. And then places I have no idea, so I'm guessing they're from all, all over the all over the the world. Okay, so we are also multicultural because these places are all different, and we bring our life experiences and of the places that we've you know been raised or feel a local from. We bring this experience to the classroom with us too. So so do our students. So this is a very multi-local place, the classroom now. You know, and, and I like to say all classrooms are international. Whether the majority of your students have Swedish nationality or not, you have a mix of language, first languages. You have a mix of different um, localities present in, in, in there. So we have a multilingual and a multicultural group. Okay, let me go back to the presentation. Okay, so what is the definition of culture? You know, it's a very large and vague uh, concept. So if we look at Lustig and Custers, they are educationalists, so this is their definition of culture within the context of education. Culture is a learned set of shared interpretations about beliefs, values, norms, and social practices which affect the behaviors of a relatively large group of people. So this means that in your classrooms, your students have different beliefs, different values, different norms, and social practices related to teaching and learning. So I'm going to show you, trying to conceptualize that a little bit today and show you some models on how to think about that. What does that mean? What are the differences in my classroom? But more importantly, how can I use that to improve the quality of, of uh, learning? Okay, so I like to use this image uh, uh, or metaphor for culture, um, the iceberg. Um, and so culture, just like anything, once you are immersed in it, the longer you are immersed in it, the more you get to know about the culture in which you're uh, evolving. So, for example, you know, when, you first, when I first got to Stockholm, you know, the first thing, the very first things that you, you identify is like, how do people queue for the bus? How, how does the supermarket work? You know, every single country has a different way of packing your bags at the supermarket till. So you have to, you know, it's little things, but that, that you know, are very obvious to you. Uh, also things like, you know, the architecture, the way the city is built, how buildings look, how you can evolve, the public transport, all those things you get to see very quickly, the differences from where you've just come. Um, once you're there a little bit longer, you start to recognize other things. So for me, when I moved here, the f the f you know, at work at least, um, it was the power distance. So the, the fact that it's in Sweden hierarchy is very flat and very implicit. Whereas in Belgium, which is French-speaking Belgium, there's a Latin culture, hierarchy is very um, present, uh, power distance is very large. Um, and so, and the other thing that really struck me as well is the gender equality. The fact that I think life as a woman, as a working woman here in Sweden is 
easier because m most people look at you as an expert and don't look at you through your, uh, your gender, sex or gender. So, um, and then, you know, the more immersed, the deeper, like the iceberg, you only see the little tip. The more you are immersed in it, the, the, you know, the deeper you are, the bigger you see, you know, you get the whole picture. And then, you know, things that take a really long time to understand about a new culture are things like the sense of humor and the political system. You know, even sometimes you never understand your own political system. You know, I come from Belgium. There's one more million inhabitants than Sweden. We have nine governments. It, the country is 15 times smaller than Sweden. So it's re understanding the politics is just really crazy. So I showed this. I went to South Africa to Stellenbosch University, and I'm, I'm doing a, a workshop for teachers there, and I'm telling them about the iceberg and intercultural, being interculturally competent, and they're looking at me in total confusion. They're looking at the iceberg, and they're looking at me like, what is, and I was like, okay, is the iceberg not speaking to you? They were like, no. <laughs> we don't have icebergs in South Africa. I'm like, yeah. Mm. I was like, yes, of course you don't. So this is me, you know, telling them, this is, you know, how we should conceptualize a culture. And I said, well, okay, so what's the corresponding image? And they told me it's the hippopotamus. Because, you know, when they say it's just to say it's the tip of the iceberg, they say it's the ears of the hippopotamus because, you know, this is just a thing that sticks out. And then, of course, the, hu the rest of the animal is under there. So that was my interculturally incompetent moment. <laughs> just to tell you, though, that, you know, I'm an expert in intercultural competence and I'm not all the time, I'm not interculturally competent. It's a lifelong personal journey. Um, you know, there's only so much that us as teachers we can do with our students. It's also about personal growth. They want, they need to want to develop. So maybe that, that is something we can kind of motivate them and inspire them to. Um, and we're not always into, it's not like, or you'll follow a workshop on intercultural competence and you're going to come out inter interculturally competent in every single context in which you come. No. It, you are, I think it's part of... You can't know everything about every culture and everywhere you go before you actually live it. Uh, and so that's something that I want you to take away. It's a process. It's associated to lifelong learning. Uh, and you cannot... Um, improve your own intercultural competence unless you are given space to reflect on it and reflect on what you learn about yourself and about the others. Okay? Um, and so, just, I wanted to, you know, in the, in the 70s, there was a whole current in education about values in education, and Paulo Freire conceptualized this, and he was followed by a number of other researchers. And Scholl stated, there is no such thing as a neutral educational process. Education either functions as an instrument that is used to facilitate the integration of the younger generation into the logic of the present system and bring about conformity to it, or it becomes the practice of freedom, the means by which men and women deal critically and creatively with reality, and discover how to participate in the transformation of their world. Now, maybe the or could be and, right? Education is a tool, and, it, and, and you know, it's been used by governments for, for good and for bad throughout history, well, throughout the, throughout the history of education. And so this idea that, you know, Whatever we're doing in the classroom, we are acculturating our students into ways of thinking, ways of doing, and ways of seeing. Um, I met a psychotherapy professor from the University of Umeå, and she said to me, you know, we recruit students who look just like us, and we teach them to do things just like we do, and then they come out into the real world, and they're lost. Because the world is no longer what it used to be when we were being, you know, when we were studying, and I thought that's a very interesting idea that uh, of, yes, we're teaching you to be, I'm teaching you to be like me. That's a lot of responsibility for us, right? Um, so, 
education is not a neutral process. So that means that we do, regardless of whatever we do, even if it's not in our ILOs, even if we don't really say it, we do model behaviors, attitudes, and values for our students. So we are models, okay? But we can also train our students and help them to, to develop a kind of way of conceptualizing this for themselves and also understand that they're going to go out into the world and also be models themselves and acculturate others into ways of thinking, ways of seeing, and ways of doing. Are you familiar with this, uh, the World Value Survey, this tool? I, I really like to show it, um, especially since I've moved to Sweden, because you're like, do you know that you are extremists? Look, this is where Sweden is. Top right-hand corner, okay? So let, let's just take a look at this. This is a, a survey that is, has, has existed since the early 80s. It's been put together by just under 200 social, so, social scientists. Uh, and they send out questionnaires regularly, the last one was in 2015, to all these countries, and then they, they plot this information on, the, on a graph to, to kind of represent where we stand in terms of values uh, in the world today. So this uh, axis here are countries, or this, this uh, uh, side of the, the axis is uh, countries that are more traditional um, and also more religious. Whereas uh, here, uh, we tend towards uh, countries where there's a separation of uh, religion and state, uh, and where, uh, se which are more secular, and ra rationalization is valued in, in those, uh, in, in those uh, countries. And then at the bottom here, it's called the survival versus self-expression value. So this, it's like wealth if you like. Here, it's countries where human energy is spent mostly uh, about where am I, what am I going to eat, how, how am I going to feed my children, have I got a roof over my head, have I got access to water and electricity and clothing. And the wealthier the countries get, people's energies are more focused on self-expression. Am I happy? What do I want out of, out of life, right? Where am I going, you know? Uh, and so you see that Sweden is right up here. I mean, even more extreme than all other Nordic countries. And so that means that your students who are going to be coming outside of Sweden into your classroom, it's gonna be a shock to them, you know? I mean, we tend to think, oh yeah, it's a shock because it's cold here in winter. But it really is about, they, if they come from countries where, which have a different set of values, they will have a completely different set of values attached to teaching and learning, right? Um, in Sweden, the education system is really about a, a lot on group work, collaboration, uh, exchange, uh, student-centered learning, and these things are not so easy. Uh, if you come from a culture, for example, where you sit through lectures and you take notes and there are hardly any questions or interaction with your teacher until the exam, right? Um, right. Also, the world is changing. Okay, I want to show you, um, are you familiar with the work of the Gapminder Foundation, which was set up by Hans Rosling? Yes? Um, and so all this information is freely available on the web, uh, by the way. And I, I use a lot of their information. Th these slides are available, among others, and also the Dollar Street. Have you used that? Yeah? So it's like um, a kind of like photo document of places around the world, and you can go into people's houses and you can see their, their bathroom, what it looks like, you can see their mode of transport, you can see what they eat, you can see where they live, uh, across different income levels within countries. So you could see like low-income people in Sweden, medium and, and high. Not for all countries, and I know that they keep on adding, uh, but I think it's quite a useful tool to use with our students 
Uh, we use them when we prepare them for exchange uh, abroad, but also in our global health programs uh, and our international uh, masters. I know they use uh, these very much. In our midwifery program, they use it as well. But so, back to demographics. So, the last, latest statistics, they're about to change, I think, within the next six months or so, but we've got them from 2015. These are based on United Nations statistics. Um, so you see that the world is represented, is divided into four different parts. Um, the Americas in green, Europe and Russia in yellow, um, Asia and Australia in red, and Africa in blue. So in the world today, there are seven billion inhabitants. Each billion is represented by one little figure here. So we have one billion in the Americas, one billion in Europe and Russia, roughly. Uh, we have one in Africa and four in Asia, okay? Now, if we look at the predictions, uh, so that means your PIN code right now is 1114. It's nice and easy to remember. By 2050, it's expected that there will be an additional uh, billion in uh, Asia and an additional billion in Africa. Population is tailoring off, right? in the Americas and in uh, Europe and, and Russia. By the beginning of the 22nd century, we see that there's going to be an additional 2 billion in Africa. And the rest of the world population st st stays unchanged. So if we look at what that means, it means that the Old West, actually, by the beginning of the 22nd century, is going to be less than 10% of the world population. So the question is, how relevant are we going to be by then if all the youth and innovation is taking place here? And it's, and it's not something for the future. I don't know if you know of the China-Africa Education Network, but it's expected that by 2050, there will be more exchanges between Africa, student exchanges between Africa and China than the Erasmus uh, uh, program. Okay? So... How relevant are we going to be by that time? And um, you know, you're all thinking, yeah, but well, I'm going to be not around, right? I was going to say retired, because of course we'll be able to live much longer. But um, it just goes to show that we also need to open up our classrooms to these changes. It also means that a lot of our students in the future, more and more, are going to come from Asia and from Africa. How open are we? to their conceptual frameworks, their ways of seeing, their ways of doing, f looking at it from our whiteness perspective and Anglo-Western perspective. Because that's what, our, what we are acculturating our students to, most of us, uh, the, the, you know, the, the research we make available to the students comes from Anglo-Western publications. We publish ourselves in Anglo-Western, we all publish in English, mostly. You know, so. There's something to be, you know, we need to think a little bit about how open are we and how inclusive are we in our classrooms to these different ways of seeing and doing and thinking. Okay. And then I just wanted to give you a quote from a um, Denison University. It's one of these uh, American universities and it's quite interesting to go and have a look how they work. They don't have faculties or disciplines. They, they work in kind of these modules, and you can pick and choose all across traditional uh, boundaries of, of disciplines to create your own kind of uh, study program. Uh, and uh, interdisciplinarity is really, you know, uh, fostered and, and encouraged. And they say that today, in the world today, for our students not just to survive but to thrive, they need to work be able to work with people who are not like them. So here I'm straight away thinking about the intercultural competences, right? Um, they also mu must be able to communicate well, their ideas well in writing and orally. So here's the language competence. And it's any language. You know, I, I, you know it's, it, it's not because I'm an... Um, English is my first language that I think we should all be only learning in English. I th I'm really for uh, plurilingualism. So, um, you know, and I think that 
teaching in English is great. We get a lot of international students, right? But we are Swedish institutions, and we need to also think about the role of, that Swedish plays uh, in, in, in our discipline and to keep that language alive, right? Okay. And we want our students to be problem solvers and to be innovative and creative. Now, that again, these are dimensions that I, uh, are attached to intercultural uh, perspectives, okay? So, I want to see if you've got an updated worldview. So, again, I went to Gapminder, and I want you to go to, uh, whoops, to Kahoot. So, I'm just going to, up. Oh. Right, so, Kahoot.it, and you have the game pin there. It's going to ask you for your name. You can be creative. So I'm going to ask you questions about the world, the state of the world, uh, according to uh, the statistics uh, found by the Gapminder Foundation. And of course, you know what the world looks like, right? You're all experts. Um, I don't know if you've ever seen, I don't, have you done these questions before? These Gapminder questions about what the state of the world is like? Um, so I'm warning you, Hans Rosling, before, um, sadly, he passed away, he did the same questionnaire with chimpanzees at Stockholm Zoo. <laughs> and generally, when we ask academics, they do less well <laughs> than the chimpanzees who scored on average 33% of right answers. Right. So the pressure's on. <laughs> okay, so let's get started. I think everybody's connected. So, we just have a test question to get you started. What did you have for breakfast today? Okay. And so you can tell me. Gröt, filok, flingor, just the coffee or something else. I've, I've marked some of them as right. <laughs> okay. Okay, it's coming. There we go. So obviously the, the, the first two were the right answers because, you know, that's only proper breakfast. And I'm glad that some of you have had really good breakfast or something else, or maybe nothing. Okay, let's go. Uh, so there are nine questions. And then we get the winner of this one is Mackie. Well done. <laughs> In the last 20 years, the proportion of people living in extreme poverty worldwide, worldwide has almost doubled, remained the same, or almost halved. Okay. So, the correct answer is almost halved. Well done. Most of you know that. And the fastest was Nulov. Okay, next question. How many of the world's one-year-old children today have been vaccinated against some disease? Is it 80, 50, or 20 percent? Okay. So the answer was 80, and most of you got that right, so well done. Again, no love in the, in the lead. Right, next question. How did the number of deaths per year from natural disasters change over the last 100 years? More than doubled, remained more or less the same, decreased to less than half. So death from natural disasters. Oh, 
Okay, so decrease to less than half. So I'm, you, are you starting to see a pattern? Okay, we have to be a bit more positive, right? <laughs> okay, and New Love is still in the lead. Next question. How many people are there in the world? You should know that, I just told you. 5.5, 6.5, 7.5, or 8.5 billion? Do you remember the pin code? Roughly. Okay, 7.5 billion. Very well, 49 of you were listening. Well done. <laughs> oh, also is now in the lead. Well done. Right, next question. Of all the people in the world today, the majority live where? Is it in low-income countries, middle-income countries, or high-income countries? Okay. And middle-income countries is the right answer, so well done to most of you. Now, just uh, you know, a, a word on terminology here. At Karolinska, we've decided we're no longer using developing and developed uh, countries because they don't reflect the reality, and they kind of make us think in this, this kind of the poor and the rich, as if, you know, you have these two categories of the world, and it's it's a completely erroneous way of looking at how the world has changed since the 70s. So I invite you also um, to change the way you talk about uh, uh, the world. And, you know, there are four categories. The middle income, you have low middle income and high middle income. So I invite you to update your, your vocabulary um, as well. So we've still got Orsa in the lead. Next question. What do you think the life expectancy in the world is today? Life expectancy. Is it 80, 70, 60, 50 in the world? So, yes, the correct answer is 70 years old. Okay. Next question. Uh, Ulle has taken a, a lead. Well done. What is the average number of babies born per woman, so the fertility rate in the world as a whole? Is it 4.5, 3.5, or 2.5 children per woman in the world today? And so, yes, it's 2.5. Okay. So that means much more access to contraception and family planning. And question nine. There were 2 billion children in 2000. How many do you and experts project there will be in 2100? Four, three, or 2 billion? So by the beginning of the 22nd century, how many children? There were 2 billion in 2000. We just looked, and so it's 2 billion. So do you remember I told you the population is kind of tailoring off? It's because we're having less babies. But at the same time, we're living longer and longer. So in fact, we'll have much more adults, right, in, in, in 2100 than there will be children. Uh, Ule is in the lead. And finally, the last question. Globally, 30-year-old men have spent 10 years in school. What about the women? Three, five, or nine years? Okay, so... The right answer is nine years. So here's a more. So I think on average you did better than the chimpanzees. <laughs> so very well done. Um, you know, these, these questions are available for free on the Gapminder 
uh, website, use them with your students. Because it forces you, you know, to kind of think, hmm, yeah, the world is not really you know, as what I thought. So you know, it kind of convinces students they need a fact-based view of the world. OK, so let me just get back to the presentation briefly. OK. So back to internationalization and developing intercultural competence in our students. And this idea of values. When you look at Jude Carroll, um, uh, she's also worked with Betty Lesk on internationalization of the curriculum, but she really looks at teacher training and teacher practice. Um, she says that developing intercultural or international perspectives doesn't happen through wishful thinking. What does that mean? It means that it's not because you're, you're a teacher and all your colleagues are from all over the world that any of you know how to manage and teach these competences and train your students in developing international perspectives. Same thing for the student group. It's not because you have a whole group of international students in your classrooms that anybody is learning intercultural competences or, or developing international perspectives. It can happen, but if it's not intentionally designed into your pedagogical framework. So that means that it's shown as an objective or an outcome. You practice it in class, get feedback on it, and then are assessed. Uh, if you don't have that, it's not going to happen. In fact, quite the contrary. We, uh, we've looked at, um, now, you know, we've got th over 30 years of Erasmus mobility. We've got a lot of statistics, and we found that students who go on Erasmus mobility without any um, you know, preparation or, dis or training in, in intercultural competences actually go abroad and it reinforces their stereotypes, which can then lead to more assumptions and prejudice and even racism and xenophobia. So I think that's something that we also need to bear in mind. It's not because you know, all these people from all over the world are that everything is fine. Now, um, you know, it sounds like we've all got it sorted at Karolinska, but we regularly have to do preventive training about managing conflict, um, dealing with critical incidents, because they happen all the time. In an intercultural setting, multicultural setting, and multilingual setting, you will have conflict. And that's not such a bad thing, because we learn a lot. If it's managed properly, and students get to reflect on what they learn, for their own personal growth, you know, it's, a, it, it, it's something that we can really use in the classroom. But it's not easy to do. So teachers need support and teachers need training uh, uh, in how to do that. Okay, I wanted to show you this uh, very simple um, diagram here, um, which shows the different values and different cultures attached to teaching and learning you know, in the world. And you, this is a spectrum, right? So this is one extreme here, and this is the other extreme. But as a lecturer or as a teacher, you can, um, or as a student, sorry, you can position yourself anywhere along the, the spectrum. So let's just have a look. So on this side, let's say, for me, when I look at this, I went to um, uh, French school, like in France, and for me that was very close to this uh, uh, side. Maybe some uh, students who have come from Asia may have this, Africa, um, Latin cultures may have this, uh, uh, these values associated to teaching and learning. So the lecturer is seen as an authority and will be respected. Uh, that means I cannot interrupt the lecturer and ask questions, because I'm here to learn from this source of knowledge in the classroom. Okay? Um, the motivation for students to be in the classroom is to excel, to be the best. So it can be quite a highly competitive uh, environment. Um, what is seen as desirable, polite, and respectful is to be quiet and not to interrupt. So effacement and silence are seen as positive. Uh, and 
the students are expecting the teacher to take the whole group of students towards the same goal of learning. So this idea of personalized curricula, um, you know, uh, is really something like, you know, per, that we're all different in the classroom and that, you know, we all learn at different speeds. The idea is that by the end, the teacher's job is to bring us all at the same level, which is impossible. But it's part of the belief system, right? So um, I'm not saying this is bad. It's just one way. It's, a, it's just different. Okay, so we no, need to learn to navigate these differences. And so if we go to the other side, I would say which is closer to the Swedish system. And for me, uh, it's really is um, uh, like the extreme here is really, I think, the American um, uh, higher education landscape. I think for many reasons, um, because um, American students from day one at school are told you have to be critical, you have to be critical, you have to be critical. So they, they ask a lot of questions, they interrupt a lot. Um, and also because education is extremely expensive and I'm thinking that they want a bit of value for money, which, you know, we can understand. So in, these, uh, in this system, the lecturer, it, it, the role is mentor or facilitator. Uh, so that means that the student comes to the classroom with uh, their own knowledge that they can build upon. Uh, it's okay to challenge the lecturer and say, I don't agree or... What do you mean? I don't understand. This is not clear. It's okay to say that. Um, the motivation for students to be there is my individual development. What's in it for me? Okay. Uh, and what is seen as desirable in the classroom, opposed to silence and not interrupting, is self-expression of ideas. I think this and I believe that and, and, and also being able to voice that in the classroom. And the student expects the teacher to look after their personal growth and creativity. So as a teacher teaching in an international classroom, you have students from all over, right? And you come into the classroom with your own whatever culture of teaching and learning you have. So it's about negotiating and navigating the space. So, you know, Always discuss this with students. In my classroom, I'm expecting you to do this and that and that. Let students negotiate this. Create an environment where even students who come from this culture, they feel safe to be able to contribute to, 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 to the classroom, to what's happening to the classroom discussions. You do that over time by doing you know, more like very structured exercises at the beginning of re reflecting by yourself, exchange with your neighbor, then don't just ask questions in a huge audience and expect students to participate. It's very daunting. You have to kind of like find a way of building up to the confidence so that students feel that, you know, they can actually interrupt you and they can ask you questions if that's your, you know, if that's your, the way you like to, to teach. Again, Another model that I think is really useful, so culture, you know, culture means many different things, but within academia, these four domains have been uh, identified. Ethnic, local, academic, disciplinary culture. So the ethnic culture is what we looked at at the beginning with my questions, what languages you speak, um, where are you local from, what's your, what are your values, uh, what is your own experience uh, that you bring into the classroom. The local culture are things like the type of... When you explain concepts to your students, what kind of um, illustrations are you giving? So are you giving um, local illustrations? Will you, all your students understand them? Um, you know, sometimes we do, you know, make references to things and people just don't know what we're talking about because we're assuming that they've got the cultural knowledge that we, we have about the subject or about the world in which we live. So, you know, things like um, ref referring to things that have happened, I don't know, in the news or, or it's okay if it's international, but if it's very local or Swedish, you need to really explain so that all the students uh, can understand what you're talking about. Um, I, I always give this example. I, I, years ago, I did a classroom observation for a chemical uh, uh, engineer. 
And she spoke English very well, but it was the first time she was teaching in English to a group that had been used to her teaching French to them. Um, and she came out after one hour, came to my office and said, I'm making jokes, nobody's laughing. I mean, I don't know what's wrong with this group. Come and sit and tell me. And, and yes, she was making jokes and she was funny, but she was making jokes about, uh, you know, um, she was mentioning Boris Johnson before he became prime minister, so no, none of the students knew who he was. She was talking about Marmite, you know, this breakfast thing that British people put on their toast, which is very salty. Nobody knew, nobody eats that in Belgium. They didn't even know what it was. You know, so yes, she was funny, but she wasn't, you know, really using the examples that the students needed to understand. Okay? Um, I'm not saying you can't use these jokes, but you have to explain them. Um, same thing with, you know, communication conventions. In, in some countries, um, when students come to you, it, it, they prefer to have a large physical distance between you. And I, I quite like speaking quite closely to people, so I always end up having to do this dance with the students until I tell myself, stop. The student needs to be, feels more comfortable being far away from me. Um, but also in the way we write, the way we address. Some t uh, uh, students need to be told it's okay to call me by my first name, but I'm still your teacher. It doesn't change anything uh, because they will call you by your title. Uh, and for the, because for them, it's like that. Some students will write very long emails uh, and will be offended if you just write, yes, that's fine, right? The Swedish way, kind of economy of words, right? I, I've, I struggle sometimes with that. I cannot do the kind of simple email thing. I'm the, I'm the annoying student that writes the really long emails. Then you've got academic culture. So, you know, the teaching style your own, which is very much based also on your personality, right? Um, beliefs about what your role is in the classroom what, and what you expect your students' role to be, but also, uh, uh, you know, learner identities. In this classroom, this is my identity. I'm here to learn, or I don't really care about this subject at all. I'm just here to like get the lowest possible pass, and and because I'm more interested in other things. So there's lots of things about learner identities um, that they bring into the classroom from their past. Also, maybe they've had like terrible teachers, and they're a little bit afraid, or maybe they've had teachers that have told them that they're stupid. And so they won't contribute to the classroom. I mean, we've all, all of us have these shared kind of uh, experiences. Um, the use of humor, which I mentioned a little bit uh, earlier, academic practices. So, you know, open door policies. Uh, it's okay to email me. I, I have to respond to you. It's the law here in Sweden. Like in Belgium, if you write an email to your teacher, you're lucky if you get an answer because there's no rules or regulation about uh, communicating. Uh, with between teachers and students. Power distance, so you know, this idea of hierarchy. Sometimes students coming from, uh, you know, this side, they don't get the whole first name basis. They think, oh, then we're friends and we're really friendly. You know, in the UK, for example, if you go with your, meet your tutor, it's quite normal to go to the pub and have a drink. Okay, but um, this is something if you come from, I don't know, Oman, will be really, really foreign to you and also a little bit unacceptable, right? So, um, so dealing with power distance is something you need to be explicit about, as well as plagiarism and punctuality. When I give you a deadline, it means that you cannot hand it in late. I will not accept it, but if you come before the deadline with a valid excuse or if you need extension, anything, that's fine. But you cannot go over... There are some cultures, like I'm, I teach in Spain quite a lot, it's really okay for teach students to walk in 35 minutes late to your class uh, and then move out again, leave. Uh, it's okay for them to kind of think that they have a week after the deadline to hand in things, but you know, you have to be quite careful. Yes, I can see that you're like, hmm. Mm, not in Sweden. Yes, I know. I know, I know like time is time, right? But th this needs to be told. You know, time is a cultural construct. Different cultures have different ways of perceiving time. Some cultures, you know, think time is natural, biological time. So not the time on the clock. And I think here in Sweden, we like the time on the clock, right? 
and the calendars. Also, another thing about time, weeks. You know, nobody else in the world knows about weeks. The only week I know is week 43. That's the only one I know. But, you know, these things, be careful as well, because it'll be very confusing for your students who don't know. And then finally, disciplinary culture. And I think this is really interesting. It's discourse conventions, different ways of talking about the discipline. Um, there are different traditions uh, which are culturally bound. You know, like, I don't know, literary theory in French is extremely dense. You have to make your sentences really obscure and difficult. Whereas you look at literary theory, once you read in other languages, it's, or English, it's a lot m more straightforward. Uh, and so, you know, these discourse conventions need to be taught or told or explicitated, made explicit for your students. Same thing with nomenclatures. You know, students will come to you and they will use different models, different tools, uh, different conceptual frameworks than what you're used to. How open are you to them sharing that? Because the more, the more models and the more conceptual frameworks there are in your classroom, the more creative your students are going to be. Remember about creativity and innovation? Being, sh being shown another way of doing makes you think uh, creatively and outside the box, which is what we want. Um, and then interdisciplinarity. So there are some cultures where really disciplines are in their silos. And, you know, things like, I don't know, looking at the influence of uh, scientific innovation on artistic creation is not something unheard of, right? Because disciplines really live in their silos. Um, and so some students may not be used to thinking about other disciplines having an influence on, on their own. Okay. So, I, we've talked about all this. So, here's another very useful framework to think about the international classroom. So, all of your classrooms are international. We've, I hope you're happy with me saying that. Uh, and so, it means that you have to consider three dimensions. The linguistic aspect, the language, any language, including Swedish. The culture, right? The culture with all the four dimensions I mentioned and the two, the spectrum. And the didactic. So for you as a teacher, what methodology do I use? What do I do in my classroom in order to help or manage this diversity so that we all get, you know, our students to be able to work with people they don't know, to be able to be effective communicators and to be creative and innovative. And so this brings me back to our national context. I invite you to go and have a look at this, the strategy, if you haven't already done so. The intercultural uh, perspectives are really prominent. There's also the Bologna communique, which you've got a, a link to here, which gives you loads of also more pointers and what, where Europe is heading to, and then the global, the sustainable development goals, and more specifically, Sustainable Development 4. Target 4.7 is the one to look at. It really uh, uh, targets, explains what quality education means in the tertiary sector, so at university. And I've put the, the, the definition here for you. And yes, I think I don't have time to go through the, the, the idea, but if you come to my workshop after the break, which is coming in like two minutes. You can have coffee. Um, I'll explain to you this, mod this model that we've adapted from um, these Flemish universities of Be in Belgium. They've come up with these four dimensions that our students need to you know, develop in terms of intended learning outcomes for internationalization. And you see the language is there, the culture is there, and then global engagement I'm just is... How do we make sure our students are committed, responsible, uh, and make meaningful interactions with the world? And you know, these are big, big ideas, and, and, and la but are they not so necessary today? Look at the political landscape that is not just sweeping Europe, but you know, the whole world. You know, it's not just about Trump and Brexit, and, but 
Bolsonaro, look at what happened in New Zealand, look at the other side of the world. There are many, many countries that are struggling with the rising national extremists. Uh, and so I think we have a really key role to play in inspiring and training our students to be these committed, responsible, and uh, make meaningful contributions to the world in which we live. And just to show you, this is what we look like at KI right now, in terms of internationalization. Some programs are just here, others are there. Other, so it's very normal to have all these different kind of experiences. And it's how can we look to these to help them do, get to this stage faster? without making the same mistakes. So I invite you to collaborate among yourselves across disciplines, across faculties, uh, and you know, to, to share the experiences and the knowledge and the know-how that you have. I'll let you go through this uh, at your leisure. These are just some things that we do with our students. These are just summary points for you to consider. The, I mentioned that there are references here, and a whole list of useful websites that are really have very practical uh, uh, recommendations for teachers in the classroom. So I wish you all the best of luck in your international and intercultural uh, endeavors, and and uh, and thank you so much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you.